You're listening to the Sledgehammer Podcast with me, Paul Ebbs. This week, we're going to be talking about the greatest show in the galaxy with one of the greatest writers in the Doctor Who galaxy, Rob Shearman. But first, a little bit of history. Back in 2017, I undertook to watch all of televised Doctor Who in one calendar year because I'm insane and have no life. I would start on January the 1st with An Unearthly Child and sledgehammer my way through come hell, high water or removal to the nearest psychiatric facility to December the 25th, finishing on Twice Upon a Time. What started out as the Doctor Who fan's equivalent of the Harj rapidly turned into a project to try to understand how Doctor Who was written and is still being written. I would watch an episode, then immediately record my impressions on how it was constructed and plotted in what became the mammoth 350,000 word Sledgehammer Diary. With Doctor Who, often it's the facts and figures, the minutiae, the actors, producers and the special effects wizards who are lauded and picked over. But I've seen very few examples of Doctor Who stories being considered as pieces of writing. This podcast, I hope, will do that. Each week, I'll have a conversation with someone who has written or still writes Doctor Who stories. I'll talk to them about why they think a particular story is worth exploring from a writing perspective and how they themselves go about writing their own Doctor Who fiction. Hopefully, at the end of each episode, we'll have taken the bonnet off and had a good rummage around in the engines of the best Doctor Who stories and given you not only the encouragement to consider these stories afresh, but maybe some insights and inspiration to write your own. The Greatest Show in the Galaxy was broadcast at the end of the 25th season of Doctor Who, beginning in December 1988. It was written by Stephen Wyatt, script edited by Andrew Cartmill, directed with enormous panache by Alan Waring, and produced by Shrinking Violet and Soberly Dressed, John Nathan Turner. It's a story that's been close to my heart since transmission, cementing Sylvester McCoy's run as the Doctor as my favourite period of the show, back when Doctor Who was innovative, daring and endlessly interesting. Greatest Show was a staggering achievement and is, for my money, in the top pantheon of all Doctor Who. If you know your Doctor Who onions, Rob Shearman should need no introduction. As the writer tasked with bringing back the Daleks to television by Russell T. Davis in 2005, he's already on your radar for writing a brilliantly received episode of the show. But there's so much more to his writing. He's a playwright, a non-fiction writer, essayist, teacher, and one of the finest crafters of short stories working right now. He has won the World Fantasy Award and recently published the mammoth three-volume collection of fantasy and horror shorts, We All Hear Stories in the Dark. We've been good friends since he wrote Punchline for me and BBV back in the mists of time, and I'm knocked out he has agreed to appear on Sledgehammer. I think you're going to enjoy this. Hello, Rob. Hello, Paulie. How are you? I'm all right. All the better for seeing you. And you. Um, thanks very much for agreeing to do this. I am absolutely uh, knocked out that you would uh, give us the time to talk no, about. No, I'm absolutely thrilled. I mean, I mean, I mean, that's part of the joy about this whole pandemic. I mean, there aren't many good things to say about the pandemic. I mean, people dying, that isn't good. People just falling down sick in the street, which I've seen a lot of today, that isn't good. But what is good, I think unarguably, and I think actually weighs against all the death, is that you can take time more easily to do podcasts <laughs> about Doctor <laughs> So I mean, you know, I think I think actually that actually justifies for me the whole thing. Fantastic, that has uh, <laughs> that has cheered me right up. Yeah. Um, yeah. So <laughs> before we get started, um, of course, everybody who's a Doctor Who fan will know you because of Dalek. 
yeah. um, and the various other things that you've done. But can you just, before we start, so that, you know, I'm, I'm sure lots of people know a bit about you, but just give us a few thumbnails of Robert Shearman, the writer. Tell us a little mm -hmm. bit. Well, I began as a theatre writer. Um, I uh, was a, a playwright and a director. Uh, I began, the Arts Council gave me a residency at a theatre in Exeter when I left university. I went on to write for Alan Aitborn in Scarborough quite regularly. And I was just basically writing what were quite dark, strange comedy plays uh, for, for regional rep theatres in Britain and sometimes outside it. And that was my life. I mean, I didn't want particularly to write television or to write prose or anything like that. And I got lured into doing BBC radio stuff. And that was pretty much how I got contacted by Big Finish in their first year, because they knew, because, because Nick Pegg, who I'd been at university with, knew I was a big Doctor Who fan, but also knew I was a, a professional writer who wrote the sort of stuff that wins awards but no one goes to see and that was quite good for Doctor Who so I did a few of those and because of that I sort of found myself breaking into television work um, somewhat reluctantly actually I was a bit old to start TV I was in my 30s and because I'd done TV um, just in time I think I was eligible to be one of those people that Russell T Davis invited to be on his first series. I think if I had been, you know, maybe six, nine months beforehand, he'd have thought, he hasn't, he hasn't done enough. But I had done just a little bit. But since having done that, and, and TV was never really my dream. Um, I, I mostly now write books. I, I write strange fiction, uh, short story things, which, again, rather like my theatre work, win lots of nice awards. You know, I won the World Fantasy Award for the first one, but don't necessarily sell. <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, basically, my 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 career spike was like there's this sort of huge sudden bubble upwards when I did Doctor Who, which confused Inland Revenue very very much. I mean, I was under investigation because having done Dalek, <laughs> and then I began writing books like Tiny Deaths and Love Songs for the Shine Cynical, and they suddenly thought that. I must be squirreling away all the money I was obviously still making. And they put me through under investigation for about a year. And, and I was getting letters from my accountant saying things like, they will stop so long as they find where your second bank account is. And I said, it'd be great if they ever found it. I mean, if they find it, I'd, I'd be really thrilled. And eventually they found out. So, um, yeah. <laughs> Well, I, I'm I'm glad that I've, I'm I'm talking to Robert Shearman, the fugitive from justice, uh, yeah. <laughs> today. I mean, in some ways, I'm only doing this podcast, mate, so it can be like a sort of declaration of innocence to HMRC. I mean, that that is why I'm doing it. It's actually part of a, a sort of plea bargain. <laughs> oh man. This is going to be great. Um, so we're gonna uh, we're gonna split this the podcast. Uh, at, as you know, we're going to start off talking about the story that you've picked, which is the greatest show in the galaxy. Uh, and then we'll do that for about 40 minutes. And then we'll talk about um, you and creating your own um, Doctor Who fiction with a with a, a, a particular emphasis on short stories. And also you've just novelized Dalek, which mm. I'm really looking forward to. Um, I, 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 I'm, I'm kind of um, very envious of anybody who's written Doctor Who for TV. That's the one thing I've, I've never got to do. But I'm even more, more envious of writing a Target novel, which is my, which is my, yeah. my dream. I'd love to have done one of those. So, it's you know, kind of a dream. I mean, it's, it's a really nice thing that after so many years, not having done Doctor Who and sort of having said a very affectionate goodbye to it, that I suddenly got, you know, to go and revisit a script which I wrote 15 years ago and mm. kind of work out what I'd do with it now. And, and that and that felt like a really a nice sort of proper, probably goodbye to Doctor Who, just actually really reveling in the idea that I could be that 12-year-old who laid out all of his target mobilizations on the bedroom floor and I could now add to that, which was so much fun. So greatest show in the galaxy. Rob, yes. I think it's 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 a magnificent story, so I'm so glad you picked it. Tell me why, from a writing point of view, a writing perspective, you think it's the one you want, why you want to talk about it. 
I think it's a strange story because it's one of those that I think broadly people now accept after years of being a bit confused by it, particularly in that sort of strange Sylvester McCoy anti, it's all killed the show, the show's dead, spite feeling that, that, that you know, that the end of the show got. I think people accept it's really very good, but it's peculiar because it's never a story which gets discussed for its writing. I mean, if you go onto the DVD extras, it's all about everything else. It's about yeah. this is the one that was rescued from a strike. This is the one filmed in a circus tent. This is the one... Um, filmed where, in a car know, park. Yeah, the, the whole car park thing. I mean, I wanted yeah. to really have a discussion about Greatest Show in the Galaxy, which didn't have to mention car parks, which didn't have to sort of really... I mean, although they're great, sort of go on mentioning how great Ian Reddington is as the chief clown. It's, it's something which has always slightly frustrated me about Greatest Show, which is that you've got this incredibly strange time in the show's history where the scripts are being increasingly experimental and very, very, I think, very individual. I mean, Stephen Wyatt, who I think is one of the very best Doctor Who writers we've ever had, with both Paradise Towers and Greatest Show, is doing stuff that no one else has done. Mm. And yet at the same time, it seems to be in part linked to what is generally going on in these obviously reduced season counts. I mean, you, you've got echoes of happiness patrol in there and you've got with the whole survival is the fittest thing and a sort of um, a hint of what happens in survival. It, it mm. feels a wave to me that Doctor Who was always what I dreamt it would be, which was a series of interesting individual, very personal writers, mm -hmm. never the sort of creating together something which is richer from the fact that they are collaborating and yet not collaborating. Mm. So Greatest Show for me was, it's always something which I'm always delighted that people love it so much because it's one of my very favourites. But I wanted to be able to talk about it as a script mm -hmm. because it doesn't get mentioned. And I don't think Stephen Wyatt gets anything like the recognition that he ought to get. He's a he's a quite successful writer outside, like you. He's a quite successful writer. Um, he's gone on to be a quite successful radio mm. writer. Um, uh, and he's a. Uh, I, I think Paradise Towers is a masterpiece. Yes. I think. I think. Um, I, I have just one issue with one aspect of Ga Greatest Show in the Galaxy, which just makes it slightly the lesser of the two. But I I, I, I think they're both magnificent. Nice. And I, I, I love what they're doing with Doctor Who. And I think my, one of my uh, theories and, and things that, that, I, that I think about of, of Cartmel's time on the show was that he was the first one to be responding to what was happening in the comics, in the comic world, in the, in the, like the Marvel comics, in the, uh, the, gra the, 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 the wider um, graphic novel what was coming through. And I think Doctor Who has always been the kind of magpie of picking up influences. Um, and one of the things that started to come in then is, is, is that influence from the, from the, from the world of comics. I don't know if that's something that you feel or if that's just my strangeness, but I, 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 te I tend to feel that that's, that's what's coming into Doctor Who then that kind of heightened reality and, and fantasy element that, that wasn't there before. I'm quite certain you're right. And of course, and I've heard Andrew talk about that and had his influences. I think that um, Alan Moore yeah. is one that he's made. I always feel a bit of a fraud whenever those things get discussed because I've got to be honest, I've never really read an awful lot of comics. Uh -huh. um, my background was reading Asterix books. Uh, and if it wasn't funny and didn't have people as ghouls and ancient, you know, ancient uh, ghoul beating each other up. I wasn't, I've, I've ever found the idea of superheroes and then the obvious brilliance of questioning that and coming at it from a different, more, more mm. mature angle, mm. um, especially interesting. I've gone back and found those things much, much later on, but in a, in a sort of academic interest. Uh -huh. So when I came to the Sylvester McCoy stuff, I mean, I was 18 years old when season 25 first aired. I was just at that sort of stage where I'd kind of given up. Um, I'd been fiercely loyal to it 
um, right through the the 18 month suspension. I, I remember when I was when I was 15 and I remember mm -hmm. coming home from school and my parents telling me with some obvious delight because they didn't like the fact that I liked Doctor Who so much mm -hmm. that the show was cancelled. And I remember my father almost dancing across the room with joy. He thought he, he thought I'd probably escape my cult. Um, but I stuck with it. But when it came back with trial and then with season 24, I'll be honest, I just felt in a funny way that the continuity for me had been broken and that I was suddenly now too old for it. I didn't mm -hmm. resent it. I wasn't one of those people who was getting angry at Delta and the Bannerman, but I was watching it while doing my Oxbridge exams and just thinking, I'm glad that this exists, but actually I prefer seeing Detective now. Mm. And then I remember watching season 25 and just finding that there was this new breath of fresh air and I didn't understand that it was coming from the comics discipline. Mm. What I understood though was that it was a complete change of writing structure and that if the stories worked or didn't work, it was partly because of the same thing. I mean, I mean, I, I know I wrote to you yesterday and I said to you jokingly when you said, well, I was ready to go with this. And I said, this is the one about the Cybermen and the Nazis, right? <laughs> actually, I was thinking about that today and Silver Nemesis does many of the same things Greatest Great Show does about how it plays around with the idea of not being that interested within explanations or plots, mm. or wanting characters to have different cadences of speaking. I mean, the fact that you've got those skinheads in Silver Nemesis talking in blank verse, and they're getting away with that. <laughs> and it's, it is rubbish, but it's also the sort of, but it isn't bland and it isn't the sort of stuff that you saw in Time Lash. I mean, what's happening, I think, with, um, with that entire season? after you get the brilliance of remembrance, which feels like it's sort of saying, well, we can do it properly if we want to, but now we're going to give you three stories back to back, which are very, very playful in their forms. And Greatest Show is the culmination of that. I mean, it's yeah. just this um, extraordinary way of just giving you scripted images as opposed to directorial images. Yeah and saying that this is sort of echoing the sort of the, the expectations of what, a, of what an adventure story should be like. Yeah. But at the same time, not feeling that it has to sort of explain that. Hmm. And it, it can sort of, the, the whole purpose of it can be sort of in a, in a not pretentious way, deconstructing it. I like the way that you can map your own interpretation onto it. It's not set. There are I I have a, a definite idea about what the thematic things that Wire and Cartman are trying to do. I'd, I'd be interested to see what you and I, as 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 people who, who love the story, probably might get completely different things from it. If we start to drill down now into the greatest show, what do you think Wire is? and Cartmill are trying to do with this particular story? I think, and, and I, I, I accept that this is perhaps with too much emphasis upon the idea of it being in the anniversary year. Mm -hmm. but my other favourite stories of the 80s are in the 20th anniversary where stories like Snake Dance and Mordred Undead mm. totally attack the idea of anniversaries yeah. and the idea of, of the importance and, the, and that sort of weight of importance. But it's nothing like as savage as it does in Greatest Show in the Galaxy, which is basically, I think, about take it, about destroying that sort of sense of Doctor Who being an institution. Mm -hmm. It just seems to be quite angry at the idea that there is that there's this sort of millstone round its neck saying this is 25 years. So obviously on 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 one level you've got that idea of that sort of forced entertainment thing and the audiences being bored and obviously the whole thing with the with the whiz kid being the obvious Doctor Who fan. But it's actually more, much more than that, I think. It's the idea that you'll get characters in, like the whiz kid, who is purely there, it would appear to be someone who knows all about it so can be expositional. And then actually everybody being too fed up with him to allow him to do his job and actually explain what's going on. It's the idea of the story which which refuses to have a beginning and refuses to have an ending. And then when you've got that bit later on where Sylv is doing all of his tricks 
and doing his rope dances and, and tying up stuff. He's telling stories about beginnings and endings and about the meanings of them. Mm-hmm. In a, in something which is terribly brave. I mean, episode one of Greatest Show refuses to start. Yes, just, <laughs> absolutely. And, and it's gorgeous for that. I mean, mm. at the time, you're looking at it with utter confusion because, I mean, almost any other Doctor Who story would start and they'd say, there's a sinister circus, Let's open with something that sinister, the circus is doing in a sinister fashion. And it just doesn't. It just shows you stuff which is happening elsewhere from the circus. And it gives you the cliffhanger of just do we bother to go in or not? And I love that so much. I completely agree. My my, I love the first episode, but it does nothing. It does it does very very little. It just presents us with a a series of archetypes. If you look at uh, the even the way. Wyatt has named the characters nobody has got a, a name they've got an archetype you've got kingpin you've got flower child you've got chief clown what he's doing I think is just creating atmosphere and giving you a series of characters who are in search of that in search of a story you don't you, you you as the audience you don't know what the story is going to be and you almost end up like being the gods of Ragnarok holding up your holding up your card saying, what the hell is going on here let's give this all zeros it's yeah, almost I mean, it's, it's almost like making the audience the gods of Ragnarok He's, he's mocking the structure of Doctor Who anyway. He's yeah. mocking the way that Doctor Who basically introduces characters mm. who are just there to die in a certain order <laughs> by actually making that explicit. So mm. you just get thrown into a room and then they just get led out one by one to be killed and they're only introduced to be killed. Yeah. And that's part of the absolute joy of it is that as soon as they appear to have anything else to offer, it just cuts them straight stone dead. I mean, it's a way in which... I mean, I think one of the most gorgeous parts about it is the way that I, I find it killingly funny watching it back. And I had not even noticed it before, but watching it today, there's that incredibly funny scene somewhere around episode three, I think. Mm-hmm. Where the ringmaster and the chief clown can't work out which of them is actually meant, meant to be the sort of the lead villain. <laughs> Who's because, in charge? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> because you've had this one scene earlier on where the ringmaster's giving the giving the chief clown instructions. He sort of, sort of takes it. And then later on, you've got, got it happening in reverse. Mm. And there's this really puzzle bit around the ticket office where they just can't work out which of them actually is the primary baddie. Because it doesn't matter. Because what, even in that story, once you reach a position where Wyatt doesn't need Morgana and the ringmaster anymore, mm. on come the clowns, put them into crates isn't you know a hamper mm, yeah puts them in there and that's their death because we don't need them anymore so they just got rid of it, it it's that it's that almost I mean, it, it always feels a little bit dangerous to talk about things just being metatextual mm-hmm. and as if that means they're good because it doesn't because anyone can do that sort of stuff and it's mm. the sort of stuff you do when you're 15 you know you suddenly realize oh i can write a story for school about Oh, the boredom of writing a story for school. But Greatest Show is amazing because it does it with such excitement and such joy that it keeps on reminding you that in the very scene where you've got them all going off to, I never really understand any of this, but I don't think you have to, to show some sort of medallion eye to a big eye down a, down a pit. Mm. And they say, well, they'll do anything they can to stop us. And that's the point when when you start with a zombie and you've mm. had no zombies in the show up to this point, but suddenly Captain Cook just wakes up. And the fact that Captain Cook is so obviously the doc- is, is a Doctor Who parallel, as is the whiz kid about Doctor Who parallel, as is the fact that you've got the whole of this sort of setup, the greatest show in the galaxy is so obviously meant to be talking about Doctor Who, and yet it's fallen on bad times and on bad faith. And it, and it began with a sort of hippie-ish idea about being peace, peace, peace and love, and it's now just jaded. I mean, part of the joke of it, again, for me, is that, and again, I didn't pick up on it when I was 18, but watching it back, you've got these peculiar scenes where Ace and Bellboy talk, and she, he's talking about how they all have these, these specific circus skills, and his circus skill was creating killer robots. <laughs> and you think... <laughs> When was that part of a circus? And and he says, 
you know, I think one of my greatest creations was this strange robot that we that we just buried in the sand somewhere, but it was but it was perverted away from me. And you think, what well, with the laser eyes? I mean, is this sort of almost funny thing that at times Stephen Wyatt appears to be a you know, sort of peddling the idea of this is a traditional Doctor Who story, mm. but it doesn't quite deliberately make any sense. And he will just get rid of characters like Bellboy. And I think when he commits suicide is one of the most extraordinary scenes in all of Doctor Who, actually. I agree with all of that. I think that's that's a really good summing up. One of my readings of it, and I was really interested to 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 discuss this with you, things that fans have I, I remember at the time people being very angry about the whiz kid. Mm. But I, I I don't I don't just see it about the whiz kid. I think it's about all audiences. And the, the the gods of Ragnarok are the are the audience, and the great sh- show in the galaxy. And one of the thematic levels, I think, is about how difficult it is to entertain. And I think that's a, I think there's a little bit of a little bit of self indulgence moves in there. I think it's I think that episode three is very much and and for when the Doctor has to entertain, is it's about. Oh, isn't it awful being entertainers and the, and audiences don't understand us and audiences you know want more and more and more and it's it's killing us and I, I just think it's not just Wizkid. Now maybe I'm wrong, maybe that's just my reading of it, but it just feels a little bit oh you know the tortured artist effect. Aren't we aren't we tortured artists? Isn't it you know because you've got you've got the circus that you know they're trapped and they the, and they've got to bring in new you know they've got they're the producer and they've got to find new and interesting acts for Ragnarok uh for the for the gods of Ragnarok and I I just feel that it it it, it the set there's a satire there that is punching down because audiences it's not their fault that they're you know that they want more stuff and I I, I was thinking today and this is what I wanted to this is what I wanted to drop in now was I was thinking today if I was remaking this today I wouldn't make the gods of Ragnarok the audience. I'd make them Simon Cow. I would make it those that they're the people. They're the people who control everything. I, I would, I would, I would not blame the audience. I would not hurt the audience. I would not think the audience were at fault. And I don't know if that's a, a bad reading or your, you know, a reading that you can cope with or, or not. Um, I, I don't disagree. I just don't care in the same way because mm. I, I don't care it's punching that way. I right. think it's making a far bigger point about the nature of art. Mm-hmm. About, it's not criticising an audience per se. It's not criticising the Doctor Who audience. It's criticising our human desire just to consume and consume and get bored and consume. And I don't find that actually punching downwards. I think that's making a, a much grander statement in a way that, the idea that you had, I think, I think that if you look at something like Bad Wolf Parting of the Ways, mm-hmm. which has a sort of echo of that, doesn't it? Mm, when you're yeah. watching versions of Weakest Link, and it's actually all being the Simon Cowell thing is is the Daleks. Mm. It's not the audience blaming. But actually, I find that the, you know, in a way that we didn't quite guess at the time, that when you had in 1988 years and years before we got things like Big Brother, the stuff that Russell is satirising later. Mm. I, I, I feel that, I don't think it, it, it's, it's an attack. I think it is an expression, not so much of sort of poor little artist, but something just wider about that sense of the, the way that creativity drains. Mm-hmm. I mean, part of the thing that always bothered me when I first watched it, and I still loved it, but it bothered me. Mm. It's the way that logically you get these acts and you put them on in the greatest show, and, you know, on, on the circus stage, and they barely use them. I mean, if you've got someone to torture, why give them only 30 seconds? Why do you get gnawed out to give him to do a strong act only to kill him because you make him do the joke? Why not drag it out a bit longer because you've got an audience to entertain? But actually that's part of the point. It's the way in which rather like greedy children you just move on so quickly to the, to, to the next thing. You don't actually even bother to, mm-hmm. to actually extract all the juice out of it that you've already got. And I find that, I find it, it, it it's that constant pressure to put on, put on, put on. 
here's an act and now it's dead. Here's an act and now it's dead. That actually is more about that difficulty about how to sustain just being an artist. Mm. And, I, and actually about just, frankly, being a human. I mean, isn't that what we do with everything? Isn't that how we consume food, how we consume love? Um, I yeah, Perhaps I'm now extrapolating too wildly, but the reason that I don't find it punching downwards, you suggest, is that I don't see any bitterness in it in the way that you sometimes can. I mean, there are examples, as we know, of, of times in Doctor Who when you've got characters which feel somewhat churlish, um, I'm trying to think of another one. There is another one where you can feel that there's something slightly against the Doctor Who fans within it. Mm-hmm. But when you compare this to something like Vengeance on Varos, for example, which is a much more real world situation where you've got people voting upon torturing, watching people, that feels to me somewhat more churlish in the way it's doing it because uh-huh. it's trying to put it into a sort of into a that sort of real politic world. What Grady's show is doing is that it, it's it, because it dances around with the idea of never quite tying the story down to anything which really makes total genre sense. I find it actually a much more sort of playful and actually much, much funnier and more life-affirming thing. When at the very end of episode four, you've effectively got Sylvester McCoy turning around and without any real explanation, it's just the uncovery of, of who the villains are is pretty much their their defeat. doesn't really matter what he does after that. It's just somebody, I think there's there's probably no more joyous image in all of Sylvester McCoy's time, which, and again, I don't understand it, but the bit when suddenly they say, we're going to make it rain, and he just magics up an umbrella and laughs at them. And at that point, you're saying, this is a writer who is just saying, I'm breaking all the rules and I'm reinventing them my way. Everybody talks, of course, it's that sort of big fan thing about that wonderful shot where Sylvester walks out of the circus tent. There's a big explosion without him noticing. And of course, we all talk about that because of the, about Sylvester's bravery and not flinching. But actually, it's also as a scripted piece. Mm. It's the fact that it's, it feels to me like it's, it's a production team saying with great optimism, actually, we're burning all of our bridges and who knows what they're going to do next. And that as a, such a sort of great liberating thing as a writer and as a and as a show which is at that point 25 years old i know that we're looking at a point now that it's 50 something <laughs> years old come up to yeah. 60 but at that point you know it seems so remarkable so we know that um that season again uh to a lot of fans and over the years and i, and I still see it now on the internet that season and and, and those stories are not as well received as as you and I received them. So, so what is your best defence? If you were defending Great Show in the Galaxy in the in the courtroom of Doctor Who to the jury of the fans, what would you what would you say? I'd say it performs the amazing high wire trapeze act of being a story which pretends half the time to be about nothing whatsoever, and yet is never boring. And other stories are out there which pretend to be about an awful lot of stuff, but which bore the pants off. <laughs> Greatest Show is a story which just keeps on changing its mind about the way in which it's relating to you and how the characters relate. And it does so in such a strange, skittish way. I mean, the fact that it really honestly does take the first 25 minutes for it even to get started properly, and it doesn't care. The fact that it has Peggy Mount. Mm-hmm. An extraordinary bit where they're having to eat vegetables. <laughs> and you're kind of wondering why. But at the same time, it's doing so because it almost feels like it's somebody doing riff, you know, like a sort of jazz thing. Mm-hmm. And again, a story after we've been, you know, I'm, I'm not that fond of Silver Nemesis, but again, it's the way those stories around that time do sort of bounce off each other somewhat. In Silver Nemesis, we've got this actually rather interesting idea of the side men being defeated by the sort of almost structural brilliance of something which is improvised, like hearing jazz. Mm -hmm. And Greta Show feels, although it's structurally very, very neat, it feels like a writer who is improvising within an interesting structure. Mm. And I I love it for that. And I and I forgive it therefore for the bits that to me don't quite make sense or don't add up. 
I forgive it for the fact that it doesn't have an ending. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's meant to have an ending. I forgive it for the fact that the actual background to the story, I don't remotely understand at all because no one else is that interested in it either. It isn't that important, the stuff about what happened to Kingpin with the eye stuff and going down the, the, down this pit. Moving towards the end of our chat, just could you talk just a little bit about character and the yeah. difference between character and archetype, about how our characters our characters aren't characters. They are representations of things rather than people you could actually meet. What do you think of, of of what Wyatt was doing with character there? Because writing, one of the things you know, I'm sure you you try to do is when you when you make when you invent a character, you try to give them a veracity and a reality. If you're if you're if that, if the story needs that, but there's no veracity or reality to a single character in um, a greatest show, and it's almost as if. It's like, like you said, it was going against what Doctor Who does. And I, I think that's a really interesting reading. It's, it's done the same with characters as well. They're not real. None of those are real people. It's a proper fantasy. And these characters, like you said, just exist to be offed. But they're not real people either. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. And it feels like a criticism of it. And it would be in a way. I mean, I was watching it again today and suddenly thinking, Part of me was thinking how modern it seemed because it's so unlike anything would have seen in the old show. And the idea of even opening with a rapping ringmaster in 1988 seems suddenly so strange and abrupt. Mm. There was, there's a scene which I thought typified for me that whole reaction I had when I was 18 watching it, thinking, well, I've not seen this before, which bizarrely is the scene where Nord in episode one turns up on his motorbike and just shouts, Oi, white face, white face, where's the gig to the psychic? And it, I just thought <laughs> that's the oddest thing because I'd never thought that would be a Doctor Who scene ever in my life. Hmm. But, so I thought how modern that was because it but, it, but it also isn't because when I compare that to anything from the show from 2005 onwards, it's the fact that it keeps on reducing the idea of empathising with characters because they're not real characters. I, th I think that's what Neil Gaiman does in uh, uh, his stories. They're mm. full of archetypes. And Neil Gaiman's writing very much, it's certainly in comics, is very much about dealing with archetypes rather than dealing with characters. And it kind of presages those, the Neil Gaiman stories, both of which I love in post-2005 Doctor Who, which again is, is that comic influence there again, dealing, you know, not so much superheroes, but dealing with archetypes. I think it's where I actually ran aground a bit when I did Doctor Who, which was that I think I was quite influenced by Greatest Show. And I was influenced by shows like Revelation of the Daleks as well, and it's black comedy thing. So when I did my Big Finish audio, was, I was writing larger than life archetypal characters for fun. And I, that was the joy of it. I was writing things like Chimes of Midnight, where everybody was basically there to be part of a game where they got murdered over and over again and were just sort of, um, they weren't emotionally real. But what Stephen gets away with, I think, so well in Greatest Show is that you get these sudden pockets of emotion, which, I mean, I, I, I find, as I say, I, I think that the sequence where Bellboy kills himself or, the, or, or actually um, in that first episode to, to Flower Child's strange i mean it's, it's the performance of d sadler which does it in part as well but, but 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 we kind of know that that sort of archetype you know when you open with two at this point we don't know them effective rebels running away being earnest and she does it so well i mean i mean there's an anger and a desperation to her which comes out of real emotion and so what I think we're watching, which I think justifies it with Greatest Show, is the idea of people who once had character now having all the bumps smoothed out and mm -hmm. being reduced to nobodies. And it's that sort of haunting sense that there was somebody somewhere at one point. The fact that the chief clown isn't given a name, the fact that they're not given names... There are no names. ...in any way dignifies it because, because you, it makes you feel that... I don't know, that... that that it isn't a writer's fault. It's the fact that this is what people have done to themselves. They have turned themselves into two-dimensional, weird, um, 
disjointed, insane thing. There's that, again, it's that wonderful bit where where the wonderfully named uh, Stool's Lady, or whatever she is called, the Peggy Mount character, mm-hmm. uh, it's the bit where they pick up Bellboy in episode one and he just collapses in front of her. And then along comes this hearse <laughs> and all the clowns get out. She just says, you say no end to you weirdos. And of course, it's it, it, and it's such a sort of strange... Um, again, meta reaction from the audience at this point. I mean, they've been watching 25 minutes of this and none of it makes any sense. And none of the images quite make any sense. I mean, the idea of a hearse in that sort of, in that setting is strange anyway. Why are clowns driving a hearse? Because it looks great. Mm. Why are they using kites to, as some sort? I mean, it, it, it's all so, so strange. And, it, and mm. it's, it's Mickey Mouse saying it to us, saying none of this seems to relate which actually I think in some ways dignifies it. I find it the most chilling cliffhanger as well. Really? When you suddenly get Captain Cook and Max going into the circus at last, and we never find out because it doesn't matter what happens to Bellboy. And Max begins to, and it, it, it's the different reactions. T.P. McKenna just sort of looks mildly curious and slightly concerned. Max starts screaming and then, Bizarrely, and again without any explanation at all, the ringmaster points a like a remote control at her and just makes her mute. Something which is not remotely covered in any other part of the story. How can you just turn a character sound off? But this is the thing, it's it's all the way through that Stephen Wyatt is playing so well with the idea that these characters do may or may not have inner lives dependent upon the moments that he chooses to give it. The way that you'll have this, it, it feels contradictory, but you'll have a sequence where Captain Cook and Nord are arguing about who should go on first. And then Nord, he's, he's going to have to go on first. And suddenly Nord changes his character. And he's looking forward to it. He's excited. And yet, and, and, and he can't start the scene where he walks into the ring. And where is it ought to be that he's frightened of going on because he's trying to avoid it? it? It looks like it's a mistake, but it isn't. He comes on looking like the whiz kid does. He's excited, he's proud, and he's so full of confidence. And yet he wasn't in the previous scene. And that ought to be an error, but it isn't because that's suddenly what the story is going to make this character before they kill him. Mm. And... All of that sounds awful, and it sounds like the worst form of writing, but it's so deliberately done. And the fact that Doctor and Ace fit into that is interesting. I mean, I I don't know that it's actually, watching it back today, I was surprised by the Doctor's anger at Ace in the first two episodes. The fact that she's reluctant to go, it's like the ghost-like thing, isn't it, later, where he's dragging her to a circus for no very good reason because she hates circuses. It's not, it's not going to be any great message for her here. She doesn't like circuses. He's punishing her by taking her to well anyway. Well, thanks very much. Then he makes her walk miles to get to it, which is weird. And then when she actually, I think, quite, quite um, legitimately hears screaming, he just says, well, I'm going to ignore you anyway. He's actually quite, he's then quite cross with her throughout the whole thing until eventually he admits that she's right. But I mean, I mean, I mean that's a strange thing as well. It's, and that feels like a critique as well of the characters. So, Rob, uh, all of that was absolutely fascinating. I mean, digging around inside this, this story with you has been an absolute joy. Is there anything you'd like to just say to sum up your feelings on the writing of uh, the greatest show in the galaxy um, before we move to other discussions? I think it's it's one of those rare scripts of the period as well, where you always spend most of classic Doctor Who seeing its background in theatre, um, dialogue heavy, um, given to speeches, stuff that, because of my own background being a theatre writer, I love. I mean, I've always thought it would have been great if I'd been a Doctor Who writer 20 years before. I'd have been quite good because um, I'm not very visual. Um, but what Greatest Show does so well is that it fi- is that it's very easy for Greatest Show to be seen as being a series of really interesting, quirky visual moments. But they are scripted. These are not things where suddenly, like in Robots of Death, for example, one of the reasons we love Robots of Death is because suddenly someone says, you know what, let's make the robots art deco. And it just looks really interesting and it gives a different flavor. And you know that in another director, um, had it been, say, years later, Pennant Roberts, when he did Time Lash or Isla Deep, would have got 
crap looking robots on a in a crap overlit set and it would have been a dreadful story because it's okay but it's the, the what makes it work is not necessarily at that moment the quality of the script and greatest show you're you're watching a writer very very rarely in doctor who try and write a story which is about a series of weird nightmare visual images in the way that we'd normally get from things in one episode like deadly assassin episode three, three yeah um, or, or actually the attempt, which is so rarely commented on a year later to do it in Visible Enemy episode three, which is obviously trying to do it again, but not do it very well. The idea of saying, let's have a moment where actually we are going to write something which is purely about pushing ourselves with the visual stuff. What Stephen Wyatt does is he just embraces for four weeks the idea that what you're seeing on a moment to moment basis is there to surprise you. And the direction is very good, but at times you do feel that it's also holding him back somewhat. You know, there are certain surprise elements where you've got characters like Captain Cook reacting with a sort of a sort of bemused shrug to things that actually ought to be David Lynchian, but they still can't quite do yet. There's that yeah. whole bit in episode one where you've got them fighting the big robot. And it ought to be a really tense, frightening bit, but it isn't really. <laughs> Um, because it's Doctor Who in 1988. But it's the fact that Stephen White is trying all that, that, that you get a sense of, of a sort of new sense of fear and unease creeping into the show. It's a whole new grammar for it, out of the idea of it being a collision of the visual not matching what the dialogue is doing. And that's mm -hmm. so deliberate, and it's such a clever piece of writing for that. And it's Great. really worth, as, I think, as, as writers, acknowledging... Paradise Towers does some, does some similar stuff as well, but Greatest Show for me is where it really sort of marries. I think it, I think it's a truly remarkable piece of writing. Thanks for that discussion on Greatest Show in the Galaxy, Rob. Had a great time talking about that. Thank now, thank you. Um, Let's talk about you and creating your own Doctor Who stories. Now, you've just novelised Dalek, which is one of the most famous post-2005 Doctor Who stories. In fact, I was stalking you a little bit on Facebook yesterday, and I saw that you were chatting to people who were telling you how brilliant. And, and Rob, you are brilliant. It's a sort of strange thing because sometimes people just copy you in, which is what happened there. You feel, well, you can all always ignore it but then you want to say thank you but then they say thank you and they want to say I find it very strange because I mean and this is I've, I've never really hidden the fact but I, I don't want it always has danger of it coming across badly if I say it Dalek for me is always an episode which I'm very proud of and I'm so grateful that I got to write for it I mean I, I think that I mean it seems almost absurd now that when Russell brought back his you know, doing the first series and bringing back the Daleks, that it wouldn't be an episode that was written by the showrunner. It's so obviously a showrunner episode. It's an arc episode. And that he gave it to me because he honoured the fact that it was very loosely inspired by a Big Finish audio I'd done. And he didn't have to have done that. But it also doesn't feel very much like the sort of work that I'm best known for outside Doctor Who, either beforehand or, or subsequently. So it's always been something of a strange outlier for me. I mean, it is mine, and it's, in, and it's mine in part because over the course of nine months, Russell took me down a road where I found I could write something different to what I normally did. But it still feels to me a little bit strange. I mean, I, I've, I'm, I'm fond of it, but I've also never quite understood until I wrote the novelization, actually, where it fitted in and how happy I was with it. So let's let's talk about novelize uh, novelizing as a as a as a as a writer. It's not something you've done before, is it? You've not no. novelized anything. So how did you approach it? Let, let's let's get down to a nuts and bolts kind of thing. Of what your I, I want to get inside your process really I wanted to know what your intentions were what your what your parameters were what you were allowed to do and what you weren't allowed to do maybe if there was any guidance given to you but I'd like to know what your process was it, it was a difficult thing because I mean I think of Doctor Who stories uh, in the classic series 
in some ways of aping the form of full length novels. I mean, I don't know why I'm gonna pick it, but I am. If you look at Planet of Evil, that feels, cause it has a lot of characters and it has, you know, and, and, the, and the story develops and they go off into space. And it feels actually like that isn't a short story. That feels like that is a long form thing, which happens to be divided over four weeks. I think the nature of doing Doctor Who in 45 minute episodes is that what you ended up doing for the more interesting ones, uh, the sort of concept based ones, is you're actually effectively telling short stories. And short stories in Doctor Who terms tend to be things which focus more upon the impact of on, on the Doctor and the companion than upon the out, you know, the, 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 the outstanding characters who are basically there to be quite functional. And that's what Dalek became. So when I first began doing Dalek back in 2003, I was writing it very much in the sort of way that I knew Doctor Who to be from the 70s. And I was trying to write characters with these full inner lives who had their own journey arcs. And there wasn't really room for that. And Russell would point out to me and say, I want it to be about a Dalek. I don't know why we're having to spend more time with this guy. <laughs> and, and I'd say, well, that's fair. And, and then we'd exterminate him. So when I came to do it as a book, I was suddenly aware that it's a short story. I mean, it only really works as a short story. It's basically a story, isn't it, about the sort of moral dilemma about how you approach uh, a villain that you are consenting to be tortured and where you draw the line. But mm. in broad terms, it's about really running up something, up some stairs until it reaches the top. And that's all that really happens. It became very obvious to me watching it back that all the Doctor does for the whole episode basically is stand in a room looking at a computer screen, waiting for the Dalek to reach him. That's not much of a novel. And as soon as you start thinking in terms of this is a full length book, I got very concerned. And I went back to earlier drafts um, when the story had, I mean, the early drafts of Dalek have so much more going on at times, but all of it's wrong. And, and what was frustrating was I, I sort of thought, well, it's possible I can salvage some of this extra stuff. And all of it was worthless. I mean, it just wasn't what the story should be doing. What Russell did was he pointed me in the right direction away from all that stuff. And to go back and reinsert it now would be stupid. It would just be the, the, the worst thing to do. So it became instead a question of my saying, the only way I can sort of turn this into something which is longer is by taking that process further and saying, okay, well, if this is going to have to be a longer form thing, one of the things that Russell was teaching through his other stories was the way in which you could sort of find those inner lives and backstories. And yeah, I couldn't sacrifice the claustrophobia of Dalek, which is, again, you know, it's set over one day. So I inserted within the, within the, the novel, you suddenly get short stories breaking out in different unnumbered chapters which pick upon various characters and give them their whole lives up to that point in a sort of way which feel quite Roald Dahlish. And so where I began with it was I looked at the torturer, the guy who gets his face baby. sucked. Yeah, and I just thought that his principal comic characteristic for me would be a man who from childbirth had terrible headaches and the only way he could ever find himself relieving the headache would be if he killed small creatures so that he's got terrible headaches at the age of five, six or seven and it's only when he kills a house fly the headache miraculously goes and over the years it just gets this greater and greater need it's only actually when he's torturing things that he's not in pain and i thought that it was just a fun idea but when you've got the sucker on his face and it's crushing his head, he gets the headache back and then mercifully it's gone. And I thought, if I can see the whole of Dalek as being a series of sort of almost strange, ironic twists and fates, that means structurally it becomes a novel. So it's, it's full of stuff like that. I mean, it's full of entirely new stories based upon something I wrote 15 years ago. That is such a Sherman-esque idea, the, the headaches that lead to the psychopath 
killing the uh, killing the small creatures. I think that's absolutely beautiful. And what that actually helps with with this discussion is what you're what you're really known for now is short stories. So mm. it's I think it's really great that you've used this as an opportunity to revisit Dalek, but also tell very Sherman esque short stories in in between the the story that we know and to link them together so just just moving away from the novelization just for a second and then we'll go back to it what's what's a short story short stories are their own very peculiar thing and i i love them short stories particularly in doctor who terms are trying never to be something else they're never trying to be novels and they're never trying to be which is the, the fault of some of them that you read in doctor who terms four part television episodes from 1976 telescope down to 5000 words what they generally are i think are ways in which you're examining what looks like one very very small moment in in somebody's life and using it as the pivot point where everything changes and that's why short stories are so weird because as a rule i mean you only create a character for a short story you know if you're taking now, a standard idea of a short story about somebody in a cafe and something happens in that cafe and that and and you derive from that a sort of ripple effect that this affects this sums up their entire life then what you're also doing is saying you're only creating that character for that being the most important moment they've ever had and in doctor who terms of course Do- the doctor who plays upon the idea of there being genuinely big, universe-defying moments. So short stories are usually about the celebration of the minute, which have a bigger, greater impact. And Doctor Who's difficulty with short storytelling is that you're usually trying to find ways of saying, to make this Doctor Who adventure worthwhile, it's about an invasion or it's about the end of time or something. And that always looks rather banal if you crush it into... 5,000 words. So it's a very difficult thing. I mean, it's Doctor Who does not, I think, naturally lend itself very well to a short story format because it's so big and melodramatic and and, and epic. So you've got to find your own very, very particular ways of doing it. And you have to sort of acknowledge while you're going into it that you're kind of distorting what Doctor Who can and usually should be by writing something which is so short. But the, the fact that the new series, I think, as I say, tells more short stories than it than the than, than the show used to is quite interesting anyway i th- i think you i think you're absolutely right there one of the things that has come from the post 2005 doctor who is that our single episodes are, are, are so compact, so about single ideas in in many respects. I, I love the forty five minute format. Is basically the Sontaran experiment, or Black Orchid, yeah. or uh, one of my all time favourites, which is the Awakening, which is it's it's a very distilled tincture of a Doctor Who story, and I think I think that's really I think it's really interesting. I mean, I've not read. Uh, your your Dalek novelization. I, I do have it on order. Um, Thank you. I think without giving too much away, I think how you've approached making expanding the story to to novel length by looking at your characters. Yeah, I mean uh, there, there, were, there were a few. I mean, they're not always the ones you expect. I mean, so what you get is it's twelve regular chapters, I think, but then suddenly inserted between certain chapters, you'll get there's the torturer's tale. You can guess who that is, but there's also yeah. the tale and that may not be who you expect all right there's the the genius's tale which is adam's background there's i mean van staten gets his background then and but there are also the little segues and things i mean it's it was about trying to sort of i mean you get to see what a dalek is like when it's born and and as a child Mm -hmm. which is quite fun because i wanted to explore that and it was doing things often which felt like they were trampling somewhat upon even what the scene was doing even though you're telling the Doctor Who story in a linear fashion, even when characters die, they do come back in other people's stories and you see different aspects of them again. And that was kind of fun. You being able to revisit it, I must, I, I, I guess, must have been a particular pleasure from that point of view to shamanize it. Yeah, but again, um, what, what I was surprised about was that I thought that there would be a point in which I was saying... Well, I thought you were wrong to change that, and I'm going to put this back in. But actually, what I was throwing, I, I, I was more ruthless than they were. I was throwing out things which I remember in meetings they weren't so sure about, and now I agreed with them. 
So I was, for example, there was a whole bit that I, I remember um, <laughs> there was this one gag. It wasn't very funny, but it did actually make it onto air, which is when they're sifting through the all, all the weapons in Adam's store and there's one which is a hairdryer. And every single time it was in the script, I mean, it always stayed in and always Russell would always say, yeah, I suspect that won't survive the next draft, but all right. And it always did. It's not in the book <laughs> because it isn't good enough. And it, it was, <laughs> it's the realisation that as I came to it, I mean, what I wanted to do actually was honour their process. So I didn't want to be appearing to correct them. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be suddenly... It, it was it was the difficulty also that the thing about Sontar and Experiment or The Awakening is that they really do feel when you look back at them uh, that they could be four-part episodes. I mean, there's enough room. So when Ian Mart or Eric Pringle novelise them, it doesn't feel like a strain. With Dalek, I just thought, I mean, I, I, it, it was when it was when I first watched Boomtown, actually. Do you remember when that went out? I was really oh. bemused. I just thought, that doesn't feel like a Doctor Who episode at all. I mean, it, it, it felt like the it, it was the furthest we'd ever got from the typical structure of what Doctor Who did. It felt genuinely like it was a small short story as opposed mm -hmm. to a real thing. Mm. And we got used to those episodes over the years. I mean, we more and more we would find those sort of beautiful things that were meant to be only if you novelize them, they should only really be about 40 pages. I think Boomtown right. is a product of the constraints that they had, that they, you know, they'd spent all their money on Doctor Dances and The Empty Child. And they had to do they had to had to do the cheap one. But I think the constraints of Boomtown and what how Russell wrote that. And what he did, what he did was, we'll 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 use Cardiff, we'll we'll use, mm. you know, a character that that we've got and we can get, and we'll just build a story from the extraneous pieces that we have, and we'll we'll put it all together, and we'll we'll have a Slitheen in it. I think the constraints are what make Boomtown brilliant. I mean, I I love Boomtown, and I think one of the things working with constraints helps helps streamline a story and it helps you go places where you might not have gone before Absolutely. so so when you wrote dalek and it, yeah. and and you said that your early drafts had too much stuff in when you started to think about 45 minutes yeah. what you can do with what that is quite a constraint yeah yeah and i and I, I didn't quite get that to begin with i don't think any of us did i think we were all trying to i mean I, and i don't think actually anyone quite got it right for a while i mean I, i'm not you know, going to criticise my my other writers on the series. No. I, I think it took a, a while to find find that tone. And I think it's, again, it was Boomtown, which, again, I didn't like when I first saw it. I thought, oh, well, I, that, that feels a bit throwaway. And it, But actually what it was really doing was ushering in an entire new way of telling Doctor Who stories, where they didn't have to feel like they were sort of pared down novels, but they could genuinely feel like they could actually... I think what I love about them is the way that they would tell the audience that we might be going from macro to micro at any moment, mm -hmm. which is one of Russell's moments of great genius is that he can do that. He can tell, as we know, epic stories and then narrow in and do something just terribly delicate. Midnight, which I think is maybe my favourite Russell episode. I think Midnight is extraordinary. Mm. But Midnight isn't a novel. Again, if you had to novelise Midnight, I don't know how you'd do it because I could cheat with Dalek by saying, okay, well, I'm going to open it up, but still make sure that I only keep the actual action of the episode as claustrophobic as it could be. But as soon as you open up Midnight and you start going into those back characters, you actually spoil them. I mean, part of mm. the point of it is that you don't know much about them and shouldn't. Whereas, you know, the whole point about that the, the air stewardess who, who who sacrifices herself is that we never even know her name. And if you suddenly give her a name and tell and, and say what her parents were like and whether she had a dog called Sushi, then that kind of spoils the whole thing, really. I I mean, that was the hard thing with... I mean, the whole approach of doing the target novelizations of the episodes is quite tricky because... And I did feel it. I, I felt in some ways that with that with that first batch, you know, where, where they did, um, they only had one that was a 45-minute episode. It was Rose, wasn't it? Mm. And also, Russell always knew that was almost like it was part four of a typical Doctor Who story where Rose just sort of tumbles. It's rather like if you watched The Massacre from Dodo's Perspective. <laughs> 
the, the massacre is actually all about basically Stephen being a bit sulky in the TARDIS because that's all that, that's all that, 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 that you know that she was ever privy to. And I think that that meant that Rose could be a novel quite easily. But as, as they're going to do more of them, I think they must be. I don't know what they're doing. But I do feel that, that those difficult constraints, I mean, Crimson Horror, I, I know Mark was telling me that he's got his own plans about how to do that as a novel, which I think is to almost tell that as a novelization and then do a either a prequel or a sequel. It's the way that Terence Dix did Shakedown when he novelized effectively that for New Adventures. Hmm. He made that simply the third section of his book. Let's just sidestep the target novelization again. How do you create a story? Where do, where do you come in with a story? Where, where does a story start for you? And then maybe we could talk about how, if, if anything, is different. Yeah, pretty much the same, and it always has been. I mean, I, I'm not very good at plot or story. I never have been. Um, I think that's my big weak area. I have got better at it with certain projects. Um, I think because I've got a little bit more patient with myself as I'm writing. What draws me into a story are finding those emotional pivot moments. So that when I was doing my big finishes, for example, um, it was what, what got me into them was knowing two or three moments of scenes where I thought that would be a really affecting bit of emotional turmoil you know um and then you write the story around it and sometimes it was about the collision between it being comedy and not comedy I mean when I, when I did my first one that was Holy Terror which I thought would be the only one I ever did in part I wanted to write a story which is really about how you approach the idea of doing a Doctor Who story with a companion who is obviously meant to be there who's funny and then putting him without his knowing it to begin with in a story that isn't Mm. You think it's funny for a while, but actually he's this walking, talking, shape-shifting penguin in a story which, I mean, it's the way that I used to think back about Doctor Who when I was young, you know, the way that they would, that you wouldn't want K-9 in, in the caves of Androzani because mm. he'd be totally wrong for it. And I thought, well, let's just accept that. I mean, we, you know, if, if they're real characters, let's put them into a thing where that tone doesn't work and see what happens. So you're almost saying the best way to write a Doctor Who story is not to write a Doctor Who story. It's find that 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 moment and then create your Doctor Who story or any kind of story around that moment. Don't sit there and say, now I'm going to write a Doctor Who story. Let that emotional pivot moment find you. The wrong way to approach writing Doctor Who fiction for, for, for me would be to say, I want to do Pyramids of Mars hmm. or I want to do an Image of the Fendal or something. For me, it's about saying I want to write about this theme or this select set of characters colliding. I don't need to know where that ends, um, and I don't. But I do need to know that there's a point to it. I mean, it's like back with Greatest Show again. I mean, I don't know entirely what the point of Greatest Show is, really. But I do know that I believe, as I watch it, that Stephen Wyatt has one. And I feel that the problem with a lot of Doctor Who sometimes and a, a, across the media, but obviously on TV as well, back in the old days, some of the new stuff is that I don't quite believe that there is a reason behind it sometimes. Um, I don't need to know what that reason is. I just need to believe that the writer has one. And I think that that's the thing to go into any form of writing with is that I, I mean, I, I, I love ambiguity. I mean, I, I don't want, I get very uncomfortable when people say, I want to write a Doctor Who story about the evils of apartheid. Hmm. And then they do it because, all right, but that also feels very, very moralistic and very finger wagging and actually very obvious. Hmm. Bit on the nose. I like to believe that, yeah, that, that if, you, if you're in control of knowing why that you're excited by doing the story and you're going to find out what the story tells you along the way, I mean, I'm not one of those writers particularly who wants to be massively led by his characters. I do love characters, but I also think that people are in inherently contradictory. What I normally do is I have a, I, I'm a big structure lover and I, and I love structure, but what I also do is, is I break the structure as I go along. So I have an idea of a story as a sort of roadmap in my head. I frequently avoid the ending and find something else. If I do do the ending, I realise it isn't the ending. And then I say to myself, and then what? So what I did in my big finishes, for example, is that I would often turn episode four 
into the episode I didn't know I was ever going to be writing because at the very end of episode three, I don't allow it to be the ending and I don't give it the uh, convenient thing it was going to be. You know, it's like, for example, if you were to have the end of Pyramids of Mars again and the very end of it, they send Sutek back and then you say, but you know what, that didn't work, cliffhanger. And you didn't know you were going to say that until that moment. And you think, I've got, I've just got to find another ending now. That I find interesting with Doctor Who in particular, because I like to feel that you're not going to the obvious point of conclusion. Because the danger with conclusions is that they always feel to the reader or to the listener as if that was what the point of the story always was. And they very rarely are. It's like Robert Holmes' stories. Episode four is never the point, because he doesn't have any stories either. So let's talk a little bit about structure. Do you have a, a, a set structure? Do you have a, a, a library of structures that you pull down and say, uh, this story needs this kind of structure? What do you, let's, let's, let's talk structure for you. Structure is what excites me. I mean, structure yep. is the thing which always is the way into a story for me. And, and mm-hmm. it's um, any story, before I can write it, I need to understand time, time limit on it. I need to know what the sort of, the, the actual tonal air of it is. But I, I sort of need to know also just how it's going to come across on the page. I mean, you can tell. I mean, I mean, my latest book is a choose-your-own-adventure of a hundred yes. and different stories. And that's purely based upon the idea of wouldn't that be an, a mad thing to structure. Um, my background working with, with Aikborn was that he would write plays in which you'd have alternative endings or where Act 2 would run backwards. And he just found that there was such a joy in saying what can be revealed about the story by playing around with the structure. You know, is is there a way... It's like, I mean, Stephen Moffat is a big structure writer, and you can tell that from things mm. as far back as Coupling. Coupling will say, I want to tell this story about this couple, but if I tell it in a split screen and have it so that one of the characters thinks that all women are, are invisible if they're ugly, which he did mm-hmm. in one episode... How what what new things are are revealed by the peculiar way in which you are perceiving this, but the characters can't. So I think that's one of the great joys of being a writer mm. is that you don't have to tell things in the fashion that the characters would be experiencing it, and it means that we become like gods, watching this and having our own much more sort of ironic and interested reaction to it. I'm absolutely one hundred percent with you on the way structure worked in things like coupling and i know um steven's doctor who i mean listen is a is an absolutely magnificent story but how do you how do you stop it becoming how do you stop it becoming excessive and overly tricksy trial and error mostly i mean i've written a lot of rubbish and i still do and sometimes it just goes too far i'm with you there brother (laughs) you know it's it's the excitement of writing. I need to be excited if I'm writing something. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's it's what makes me, I think, quite a, quite an annoying writer to work with sometimes is that if I'm not interested in it, I don't want to do it particularly. I, I want to feel that this is going to, going to be a, a surprising journey. And if it's something where I just feel this is going to be like the thing I did two years ago, just, just the same, um, I already get bored of it. It's one of the reasons why when I was doing television work, I mean, when I, I mean, Russell was really kind to me on Dalek. He didn't make me structure it first. He didn't make me give a scene breakdown. He just said, look, it, it doesn't work for you. You just go away and play with the structure in your own way by writing it out. And then we'll talk about the results. And that was a different process to writers that I knew who'd done more TV first were doing it. But he was very open to that. I am so jealous of that because all of the television work I've ever done. So I had to start with a one one page story, then a scene breakdown, then a scene by scene before you even get the uh, the chance to write write a script. And I the, I, I want to reach through the the zoom now and just strangle you. <laughs> and, and, and you know what? I mean, that's probably the best method. And the reason I'm not a very good TV writer is because it, that's so hard for me because. I just get bored. I mean, Mm. for me, the hardest part, the most exciting part is the structuring. Mm. If I'm doing that, I might as well be writing a dialogue as well. Mm -hmm. And so once actually I give the scene breakdown, because I have done it in the past, I feel feel I'm done with it. I don't want to do any more. I mean, I've done it. I mean, that that was the point, wasn't it? The, that's a... one of the things about writing a short story. I mean, I mean, part of the part of the, the of the actual fun, and also one of the I think one of the great joys of modern who is that almost all Doctor Who before 
2005, was basically being told in a sort of consecutive time so that if it ran 100 minutes, it took about 100 minutes actually for it to happen half the time. I mean, you get things happening, oh, it's the next day sometimes. But you never got that idea of now it's four years later, which they're now doing, I mean, even with Jodie Whittaker's stuff, which I feel is a bit less um, experimental in many ways, but they could still do something where, which was impossible to imagine when we were young fans, you'd actually have the Christmas special open and she'd been there for in jail for years. You just would never have done that. I mean, Peter, Peter Davison's time, which is when I was a big fan, that honestly could probably have taken place in about three months, the whole of it, because it just looks like it probably all ran back to back. I mean, I know that there've obviously been massive numbers of novels and big finishes, but you know, at, at the time you're experiencing it, it all feels like it's happening. Very, very quick stories being told at the basic speed that you're watching them, and then you're on to the next one. And it's only this sort of way in which it's once you start in, in really enjoying structure that you can suddenly say things like, you know, the fact that series six, Stephen's uh, second series, the, the second Matt Smith series, takes place over hundreds and hundreds of years, because that's the point he's making, is that when you first see Matt Smith, that's the future Matt Smith. But it's still a, the Matt Smith you're going to encounter at the end of that season. The idea that a season would last hundreds of years is bonkers to fans growing up as we did, where 26 episodes would basically last, I mean, City of Death lasts as long as City of Death takes to watch, doesn't it? I mean, that's the point. I, do, I think uh, Marco Polo takes place over a few months, doesn't it? it does. But yes. the, 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 they're, you're right, they're very, very few and far between. So structure... I, so every story has to have a beginning, middle, and end, but not necessarily in that order. Absolutely. Um, in, in, I don't it, have to necessarily know what the beginning or the end is. I mean, I think it's helpful to know what your middle is. Yes, because that's you're, usually where the point of it is. Your your pivot point. I, I don't believe this. You said you're not very good at plot, uh, or it's not what interests you. Why is is plot something that is not important in what you create? I'm, I think it's it's not that I think plot is a bad thing. I mean, it's what I read for and it's what I watch TV for. If I'm watching Breaking Bad or The Sopranos or, you know, any shows that I've been binging on during lockdown, or, um, <laughs> then I'm wanting to find out what happens next. And I, and I love the idea of there being that sort of tremendous momentum into more story. I just know, unfortunately... I think that the way my brain works is that it kind of wants to explore something in a bit more of a minimalist fashion so that um, I'm finding my way out of it. I mean, most of the, I mean, when I began writing short stories properly, they are all quite uh, minimal. I mean, they're, and, and they're not now. I mean, I mean, I think that I can now write proper lengthy stories, but in a sort of nevertheless, a sort of long, short story form. And mm. I'll probably get there. I'm, I'm, I'm meant to be writing proper novels. And the problem with that, of course, is that they determine actual proper consequences and then more things happen as a result. And that's just simply not been mostly the way in which I've usually written before. I, I think gonna... theatre does that. I mean, theatre tends to... Well, the theatre I wrote, I mean, theatre, again, has changed a lot since I was mostly doing it. But the theatre I was mostly writing again, felt like it was taking place in a fairly small... I mean, I mean, I, I had plays which were... Every scene was a year afterwards, but they still felt like short story explorations. Mm. They weren't novels. And I think that you can go and see the theatre now and see things which feel properly novelistic. And I, and it's, it's, it's a question of just how, how your brain works. I mean, I think the plot is great. I just think it's probably my, my weakest area. So obviously uh, short stories are not as plot dependent as, as, as novels or longer, longer form. How much work do you do on, a, on the structure of a story and what's going to happen in the story before you write it? Or are you, or, or do you discover it? Like I think Stephen King has a has a, a thing in his his on writing book where he says the stories he writes are like archaeology. He just chips away at a, a, a bone that's sticking out of the um, out of the ground, and like archaeology, he he brushes away all of the the words around it, and he eventually he uncovers the story, the dinosaur. So are you that kind of writer, 
Yeah, increasingly. I mean, uh, it's it's odd. I mean, the, the book which I've you know that 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 monster, which took me about nine years to do. Um, some of the stories in there took me several years to write because you'd get the idea, and then you'd say, I mean, for example, there's a story in there about which is a gag. It's about a man who, in the 1930s, is the first man to discover that the best way to build skyscrapers in New York is to start at the base and build upwards. Because <laughs> up to that point, everyone's been doing it the other way around. You know, everyone's been coming up to, to bits of scaffolding and laying the bricks and having to support them. And that's always how big buildings are always built until this man discovers the obvious method. And I thought that was quite funny. Mm. And I, it took me years to work out actually what 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 the proper emotional beat of the story was. And, and it's there's a lot going on in that now. I think when I began writing, I'd have been tempted just to write that as a series of gags and move on. It would have been pointless. It's it's about having the patience to excavate and find, and that's usually through, through structure. Mm-hmm. It's usually by saying, here's a nice idea. It has to collide with lots of other things to make this worthwhile. Most of those other things will be dictated by structural necessity and also just working out really what it is you want to say beyond it just being quite a funny conceit. Because I think that what I'm quite good at is coming up with funny concepts and interesting ideas. And I can get story and plot out of that, but only maybe a couple of beats of it. What I try and do is wait and see whether these things can cook. And sometimes they take years to cook and sometimes they absolutely never cook. But I have not I have notebooks, I write stuff down. I mean, mm-hmm. even with the big finish stuff, and this was so many years ago now, but the Holy Terror, my, my first audio was based upon ideas I'd had for a stage play, which I had never got round to finding out how to make work for about seven or eight years beforehand. Mm-hmm. I just had this idea, which I read about in a history book about... Um, I think it was James the first who had this idea that if you were to separate two babies at birth from all other human contact, the language they would develop to talk to each other because they were innocent would be the language of God. Mm-hmm. I thought that was great. Mm. I couldn't find any way of making it work. And I never really worked out how to do a story for it. And then when I was asked by, by Gary Russell to do a Doctor Who, I thought, well, I'll use that one then. <laughs> I just, I'll, I'll just stick a penguin in it. And, and 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 that became, without my ever realising it, the basis for a Doctor Who adventure, because it was so outlandish and weird, but also kind of creepy. It didn't really fit in with being being an, an Alan Aitborn comedy. That's so brilliant. it was, sometimes you just have to wait for those things to work. But it's it's largely a structural decision, actually. It's brilliant, Rob. We're, we're, we're coming towards the end of our time now, and uh, I'm starting to, I want to start a tradition. So this is the second one that we've, um, that I've, that I've recorded with a, with a writer. So our tradition is to finish off on, on two questions. What's the best bit of writing advice you've ever been given? What I tell people now, I, 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 want to add a, I think it came out of a conversation with someone. I can't remember it was specific advice, but it's, it's the recognition that it took me years to realise that everything that's ever written is spontaneous because the biggest problem for writers, I feel, is imposter syndrome. It's the idea that everything out there looks complete and you realise that no matter how much you prepare and how, how what a great idea that you have for a story, you know you're busking it and therefore you feel like a fraud because you look at, at the shelves in bookshops or you watch a bit of TV or you, or, or you see a movie And it just looks perfect because it's done now and somehow magically it was like it was always meant to be. And what we don't ever appreciate is, you know, the opening of Pride and Prejudice, which is a terribly famous opening sentence, would have been a very different opening sentence if you'd taken, you'd written it half an hour later after a cup of coffee. (laughs) And yet we kind of believe that there's an inevitability to, to, to the great moments of great writing. And there isn't. So when we're writing something and it all comes out and you know that in the back of your mind, you're saying, if I go out and have a cup of coffee first, um, maybe it'll be better. Maybe it'll be worse. I know it will be different. And because it will be different, this isn't perfect, sometimes freezes you. And it's just the recognition that every single thing that in your head looks like it was inevitably going to happen because it's now so fixed never was. Everything ever written was written by a writer who at the same point also thought, if I would go out for half an hour, 
it will be different words I come back to. And knowing that, I think, actually is a strength. Nice. Because we're all making it up as we go along, all of us, and we always have been. I, that, that's absolutely fantastic. And I, I, I couldn't agree more. So the second part of our tradition is to give a piece of advice. Give some advice to writers. The few times they've let me do teaching and stuff, because I have done a bit, um, it's reminding people what we write doesn't kill people, that everyone gets a bit scared of it. I mean, I get scared. I find writing always. I mean, I've been writing now full time since about 1991. God, that's awful. <laughs> that's 30 years. But I'm still scared of it because I don't know what I'm doing. And I, I write some terrible stuff that I then try and get rid of or bury or put in drawers. And some stuff I think isn't bad. And it was. So that, that so it comes out and then you um, regret it. But it's the fact of the matter is that if you were training to be a really bad doctor or a really bad airline pilot, people might possibly die if you just crash the plane. Whereas I can crash all the planes I want and so can every other writer out there. And it's fine. It, no one's going to get really hurt. Basically, what I'm saying is it doesn't matter if you write some shit because you have to. So write it and don't be scared of it. That's the, that's the advice I give. Oh, man, that is, that is fabulous. That is so made me laugh. Robert, <laughs> Robert Shearman, thank you very much for, very welcome. for being on, on this podcast. And massive Mr. Equator-like thanks to Robert Shearman for being an absolutely amazing guest. I spent more time laughing um, than I did speaking. Again, I've learned loads. I hope you have too. We'll be back next week on your podcast platform of choice with another fantastic writer to chat about Doctor Who and how they write it. 